So first of all, thanks so much to, uh, to uh, Dr. Schlame and Dr. Toth uh, for uh, the invitation to come here and speak, and of course for the, uh, the, the, the financial support. That's, uh, it, it definitely got us through a real tough spot there, so uh, I'm very grateful for that. And then of course, um, it's always wonderful to, uh, to uh, hear a uh, uh, moving story from Ryan uh, about his experiences with, with Barth syndrome. Um, you know, I've asked myself, I guess, when I was a younger man, um, you know, what the kinds of big questions uh, are like that, you know, so, um, you know, what's the point? And the answer that I came up with was, you know, to apply whatever your particular enthusiasms and talents are, you know, to try to do some good with your life. And uh, I'm very grateful to the Barth Syndrome Foundation for, for giving us money to try to apply our passion for science to to uh, making a meaningful difference in, in a disease that, that is devastating and uh, affects these wonderful people. So that said, uh, I will launch into what may be a very provocative talk. Um, we're new to the field, so I, I'm sure that'll be riddled with, uh, with uh, defects, which I hope you'll point out to me and, and uh, we'll enjoy talking about it. So that the, uh, the gist, though, is uh, do other uh, glycerophospholipids contribute to the pathogenesis of Barth syndrome? So, I'll start off with just a little, a bit of a description about uh, tofazin structure, uh, particularly the homology to uh, the uh, uh, GPAT and AGPAT family of enzymes. Uh, these are glycerol phosphate uh, acyl transferases and acyl glycerol phosphate uh, acyl transfer transferases. Uh, this was shown in 1997 by Andrew Newald. Uh, the GPATs and the AGPATs generate lysophosphatidic acid and a phosphatidic acid. Uh, from glycerol 3 uh, phosphate uh, and acyl CoA, as you can see here, the GPAT reaction. You get lysophosphatidic acid, acyl CoA goes in a uh, GPAT, phosphatidic acid. And this is sort of the fountainhead for uh, all of the other complex lipids in the cell. So you get all your phospholipids, uh, you get all of your triglycerides, everything it arises from this, this sort of uh, generative point uh, uh, in lipid uh, synthesis. So um, this is just a little bit of the of the wonky uh, alignment. So you see the, uh, the first sort of catalysis motif here, um, some other motifs associated with glycerol 3-phosphate binding, and then a final catalysis motif, um, and kind of a, a, another uh, motif that's less uh, well understood. Um, but overall, you get about 21% uh, identical amino acids and, and uh, similarities of about 15% uh, for an overall reasonable homology. So this is where we enter the uh, picture. So uh, I'll tell you the truth uh, of how this happened, actually. Uh, we were interested in, in uh, obesity, and particularly an N-acylated uh, form of phosphatidylethanolamine, and it was reported in uh, a JBC paper that uh, this enzyme in Arabidopsis, that, that uh, it's uh, so many numbers I won't attempt to say it here at the moment, uh, but uh, was the synthesis, the synthase for this N-acyl uh, phosphatidylethanolamine uh, being a bit of a dummy, I didn't actually check the mass spec in the paper carefully enough, so actually what was happening is the uh, ATG 78690 uh, was making an acyl phosphatidylglycerol, which is also a very unusual triacylated lipid, but it's not NAPE, the N-acyl uh, 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 PE uh, enzyme. However, um, at that point we had, we had uh, blasted uh, the uh, amino acid sequence, and what you can see here is that tofazin is actually as far as we can tell, most similar to uh, AT1G78690. So you look at the, the alignment score, uh, it was 64 for AGPAT1, for this it's actually 316. So these are very similar, these are very similar enzymes. Um, so what is the function of AT1G786? So it is a uh, lysophospholipid acyl transferase that reacylates uh, lysopls at the SN2 position so what you can see here is uh, the control uh, lane where you have one acyl lyso PE. When you add the uh, vector expressing uh, the gene, you generate PE. Similarly over here, if you have one acyl lyso PG, uh, you add the vector, you get PG, and then you get a little teeny spot of the triisolated lipid I mentioned, uh, acyl PG. So that got us thinking. Um, so at this point, we, we, we were aware of the homology with tofazin, and uh, we'd already actually pulled the, uh, pulled the trigger on the, the uh, lipidomics that we were doing. So we had all of the data from basically every glycerophospholipid we could conceive of measuring. So we thought we'd just carry on with the, uh, 
with the project, and so we started reading a little bit about Barth syndrome. So one thing that, that intrigued us, um, and at the time I was in the neurology department at the University of Iowa, so we, we had a few people that we could ask. Um, so mitochondrial disease often involves the brain, of course. So complex one, complex two, uh, complex three deficiencies, they result in, in a mitochondrial encephalopathy, uh, acidosis, a stroke-like episode, similarly ATP uh, synthase, uh, defects uh, are, are associated with uh, neurophenotypes, uh, spe specifically ataxia and neuropathy. Uh, similarly, um, uh, point mutations in the mitochondrial uh, genome are associated with, uh, with, uh, with neurocognitive phenotypes as well. So if you actually do the uh, tabulation and you come up with the total, about 87% of major mitochondrial diseases involve uh, uh, neurological symptoms on some level. So that brings us to the uh, the next point that, that, that uh, uh, we thought was very intriguing when it comes to the uh, cardiolipin hypothesis uh, of Barth syndrome, which was the uh, recent work um, that was actually uh, done by uh, Tricia Grevengood, who's uh, Gravengood, excuse me, Gravengood, who's here in the audience today, uh, working on the enzyme acyl-CoA synthetase 1, which uh, takes fatty acids and generates uh, fatty acyl CoAs, which then can be dispatched into the mitochondria to be oxidized, or they can be used to generate uh, uh, complex uh, glycerophospholipids or other types of cellular lipids. So what they did was to, uh, to generate a conditional uh, knockout of ACSL1, uh, and specifically uh, one of the, the major findings was that uh, tetralinoleal cardiolipin is reduced by about 80% uh, in, in these mice, so it's a really spectacular uh, decrease. Once again, this provocative data is, is Trisha's responsibility to, to justify and, and defend. So she has a wonderful poster uh, that, I, that I encourage you to go visit. Uh, it was also done in collaboration with Bob Murphy's group at, at the University of Colorado. So the, uh, the, the lipidomics is, 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 is first, first really first rate. Uh, this is a MALDI image just to, to, to provide um, a little visual pizzazz to the uh, the bar graph, so what you can see here in the uh, control condition is the, the tetralinoleal cardiolipin. This is a slice from the heart. Uh, you can see uh, the heat map, of course, the intensity increases with the abundance of the cardiolipin, and there's about uh, an 80% decrease uh, in cardiolipin in the uh, ACSL1 knockout, and also a shift uh, uh, towards more, uh, more uh, saturated uh, species. So interestingly, uh, in this model as well, uh, you have um, hypertrophy uh, with uh, some diastolic dysfunction, but you have normal lifespan, and uh, the animals uh, resist, uh, resist uh, heart failure in response to, cardiac, to, uh, to, to, to um, physiological challenges like aortic banding, for example. And this is all Trisha's work, so uh, I'm sure she'll be happy to, to go over the details with this. But um, from my perspective, the implication uh, in aggregate of all this uh, evidence is that um, there may be reasons to think that there could be phospholipid uh, changes beyond just cardiolipin that really do contribute uh, pathologically to the, the ontogenesis of Barth syndrome. So this leads us to our hypothesis, which simply stated is that tefazin might have uh, physiological substrates other than cardiolipin. And that our next thought, being uh, lipid enthusiasts and mass spectrometry enthusiasts, was that if we broadly interrogated the lipidome using really large groups to try to minimize the amount of stochasticity in our, in our, in our data sets, that we might actually be able to identify specific parts of the pathway so that we're affected to, to identify a kind of causal lipid changes. And of course, the overarching rationale for doing this is that if you can identify the changes, perhaps you can replace them um, of course, this is a big, a big step, but that's the overarching goal of what we're doing here. So our approach was to use shotgun lipidomics from adult uh, TAS knockdown and wild-type mice, which are great. Uh, we've worked with those a lot now. Um, so we are able to look uh, quantitatively at about 400 glycerophospholipids at the same time. Uh, we do this in collaboration with uh, Ruth Welty's group uh, at Kansas State and we used uh, five or six uh, mice per group per tissue, and then we, we intersected the data sets to try to further reduce noise to essentially uh, come up with, a, with a, an overall uh, picture of the lipids that were changing in the same direction in both tissues. In addition to that, we used an untargeted lipidomics approach using an LCMS-based method 
uh, where we basically look at a few thousand compounds per run. We'll do an hour-long run uh, in positive and then negative mode, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, use uh, the program XCMS from scripts to overlay all the different changes. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this today because uh, my great student, Michelle Gorecki, has a poster on this. And uh, I will just say that we see the monolysocardiolipins go up, so the positive control works. The, the overall method w w was sound. So what did we find when we did the, un the uh, glycerophospholipidomics? The really striking thing uh, actually was what didn't change. So you don't see any change in lysopc, PC, sphingomyelin, uh, PE, um, PI, but in muscle we saw about a 50% decrease in phosphatidylserine, which we thought, okay, you know, it's interesting, but, but what does it mean? Did the same analysis in heart. We see changes, of course, in the absolute mole percentage of different lipids, like for example, there's less PC in the heart and more PE um, for reasons that we're not sure about, but we saw the same 50% or so decrease in phosphatidylserine. Which, so now we're, in, we're, you know, we're legitimately intrigued at this point. Um, and this, of course, was a lipidomic data set that was generated by accident because I'm too much of a dummy to interpret the mass spec data correctly in the first paper that was saying that it was making NACL PEs instead of the NACL PGs, which it actually, or the PGs that it actually was. So anyway, this was kind of an accident, but it was a happy accident. Um, this is Michelle's work. So. What we thought we'd do next, um, because some of the in vitro uh, assays of, uh, of uh, lipid transfer can be a little squirrely, we thought that we would use immobilized phosphatidyl uh, serine and other lipids on a strip as bait to see if we could uh, enrich, uh, or we could see if, if the interaction of tofazin would be uh, enhanced uh, for, with its particular substrates or products. So what you can see here is just a bunch of different lipids that were spotted on a, on a nitrocellulose membrane. And the really uh, striking thing that comes out of this is that you get binding to phosphatidic acid, and then uh, the most binding actually is to phosphatidylserine uh, on this immobilized membrane. So of course, this isn't you know, a gold standard assay, but we are, again, you know, quite intrigued by this result. As a positive control, we also uh, ran the uh, assay using recombinant uh, ATGL incubated with, uh, with the same type of lipid membrane. And what we see is that it uh, actually also binds specifically to diacylglycerol, which is its product, and then also phosphatidic acid. So PS, uh, is a very interesting molecule, and at this point, what we're trying to do is to uh, connect the dots in, insofar as how um, phosphatidylserine might uh, be involved in, in uh, causing Barth syndrome pathology. Um, it's, ex it's, uh, ex its localization in the cell is polarized, so basically it's only found on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, and it's important for protein targeting. Uh, it's extensively remodeled at the SN2 position, uh, with polyunsaturated fatty acids, so it doesn't resemble its precursor lipids very much, uh, namely PC and PE. Um, interestingly, it's also generated in the mitochondrially associated membranes, uh, which are, uh, as the name of course suggests, juxtaposed to the mitochondria, and uh, PS actually traffics into the mitochondria and is an important source of, of intermitochondrial PE, but then also it's a, an important source of cellular PS, and actually the point of PS trafficking through the mitochondria is, is, is um, not something that's, that's completely understood. Interestingly, though, when you knock out um, phosphatidylserine decarboxylase in the mitochondria, you get uh, embryonic lethality and mitochondrial morph morphological defects, suggesting that this uh, PE generation is quite important for uh, function. But germane to what I'm going to talk about, PS also binds to C2 domains in proteins. And it's important in a variety of different processes, specifically um, vesicle fusion to membranes uh, and, and other things, uh, uh, phospholipase activity, um, generation of intracellular signaling metabolites, things, things of that sort. So what Michelle did was to assemble a catalog of proteins just as a heuristic method to try to come up with something to connect the changes in PS that we see in heart and skeletal muscle uh, to 
uh, disease process in Barth syndrome, uh, she came up with a list of all human proteins containing a C2 domain. Um, I don't expect you to read them all, but we were very interested in one uh, that's called disferlin. So what is disferlin? Uh, it's related to the C. elegans protein FER1, uh, which is a, is a mutant that accumulates uh, intracellular vesicles, sort of indistinct membrane membrane membranous uh, uh, vesicles that can't fuse, it has a fertility defect, uh, problems with membrane fusion. But most interestingly to us, and the reason that we, st we decided to focus in on this protein is that mutations in disferlin actually are the cause of two human muscular dystrophies, Miyoshi myopathy and limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2. So this was really provocative to us. So basically disferlin is, is, is uh, oh, I'll go into this first. Just to prove to you first that disferlin binds to PS. This has been shown a couple times, but we, th we thought it was important enough that we should actually you know, do it in our own hands. And by our own hands, I mean in Michelle's hands, because that was how it happened in this particular instance. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, it binds PS, also PA, and uh, phosphatidyl inositol. So OK, so we have decreased PS in heart, decreased PS in muscle. We have PS binding to dysferlin, which is mutated in two types of muscular dystrophy. Here we go. Michelle. So what happens in the dysferlin knockout mouse? And what does dysferlin do? So what you can see here is, is in images of uh, laser-induced membrane injury in the wild-type mouse, when you shoot a muscle fiber with a laser, you get a very small uh, infiltration of this membrane impermeant dye, which you can see here is the little green dot. So basically what happens is you bust the membrane and it's patched quite rapidly in a wild type cell. Especially, this is especially important in muscle and heart cells because they're constantly getting you know, smashed because they're contracting and, and, and uh, you're always experiencing membrane damage. So this process, interestingly, is calcium dependent, which is a known facet of C2 domain association with phospholipids is calcium. So basically the model is that you get uh, membrane rupture, calcium rushes in, generates a very high uh, concentration near the site of damage, and then the uh, dysferlin will patch the uh, membrane here. And so what you can see is when you have calcium present in the dysferlin knockout mouse and you injure the membrane, you still get this huge infiltration of membrane and permeant dye into the cell. Taking away calcium has no further effect. So basically, by preventing the interaction of dysferlin with the phospholipid, you can't, you can't close the holes in your membrane very quickly. And you know, the thing that intrigued me about this was that it's really it's a tissue um, repair interaction because the specific features of the muscle in the heart are what make it vulnerable to the damage that's affected by you, or it, makes it, it makes this mechanism very important um, because other, other cells presumably are also damaged but not as frequently or not as severely and so perhaps by some other you know, compensatory mechanism they're able to, you know, to, to, to put the, uh, the phospholipid in the dike as it were. I don't know if that's an appropriate expression. So another thing that, that you can see in, in this uh, work is, is uh, histology. So if you take mice in vivo and you inject them with the same dye, uh, the membrane impermeant dye, and you look at the muscle fibers um, in a wild type animal, because the membranes are closed, you don't get any dye inside of the muscle fibers. Inside of the sarcolemma, it's impermeant and sealed. In this dysferlin knockout, on the other hand, um, you see all these red dots, which that is the dye entering into the muscle fibers. So they're in, in it, unable to exclude the dye. They take it up in vivo. Um, just because they, they can't patch themselves. So what Michelle decided to do uh, was to um, take uh, some SH uh, TAS mice and wild types for a jog and then to give them the same dye and to look uh, at what happened uh, in, in the muscle fiber uh, to, uh, to dye exclusion to see uh, do bar syndrome mice uh, have deficits in excluding this dye. So if you look in the control, as you saw on the last slide, no dye uptake. However, 
SH TAS mice, you have a huge amount of dye entry in, into the cells. So really implies to us, and of course we're, you know, we, we like to poke these things a lot, so we're going we're to investigate this in, in great detail, but our, our first experiments really suggest that the membranes of the cells are leaky, really leaky. Um, I was flabbergasted, so again, Michelle, wonderful student in the lab. Uh, she's looking to uh, go to medical school soon, so I would greatly encourage anyone who's looking for a wonderful, wonderful summer uh, project student to, to find her at her poster and, uh, and uh, talk to her, because she won't work for me anymore, unfortunately. I wish she would, but she won't. <laughs> so the conclusions of, of this uh, sort of preliminary work um, of course, are that uh, tefazin knockdown in vivo perturbs glycerophospholipid homeostasis in heart and skeletal muscle beyond uh, just cardiolipin. In monolysocardiolipin, importantly, we definitely see, we see changes in cardiolipin, we see changes in monolysocardiolipin. We're not saying that we don't at all. Uh, we're just arguing that there, there are a lot of things going on, and, and the, the aggregate uh, conclusion is that um, there's aberrant plasma membrane permeability in, in muscle. And we think that that is probably going to be a contributor to the disease ontogeny in, in the end, in conjunction with mitochondrial dysfunction and the other lipid abnormalities, because Barr syndrome doesn't phenocopy dysferlinopathies. It's got a lot of similarities, but it's not exact. So there's something else you know, going on, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in these conditions anyway. So there's, there's still a lot to be understood. But we're, we're intrigued for sure. Um, however, there, there may be an upside to the leakiness that, that could be interesting. I mean, the, the permeability uh, could potentially facilitate delivery of things that we wouldn't normally think of as being membrane permeable. So that's the final corollary that I would say. And then uh, the most important part, of course, is to, to, to um, really acknowledge the wonderful people that I worked with. Michelle came to, to the lab in 2011 as an 18-year-old, and she's just taken off, and this became her project, and she really prosecuted this. Um, you know, uh, over the bad ideas that I was trying to force upon her and other, th other things. So, and of course, Tricia, for her wonderful ACLS01 uh, data. Amanda's another great student in the lab. Uh, my boss, the chairman of neurology, uh, our lipidomics collaborators, Zaza for the wonderful, uh, some of the tissues early on, and uh, of course, Michael for the invitation, Matt for running everything, and the Bar Syndrome Foundation for uh, providing us with uh, funding to do the work. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Matt, for this very interesting talk and full of uh, new and unpublished data. It was very interesting and Thanks. also for keeping the time. So you have time for questions. Let me ask the, uh, let me ask the first, first question. So one of the f things you found that um, uh, in your Tafazian knockdown model, your uh, PE was increased and PC was slightly decreased, right? Um, uh, uh, PC, PC? In, the, in your lipidomics analysis. Yeah, so yeah. there were, we do see changes in some PC and PE species. species. Right. Yes, so definitely. It's not that surprising, and one possible explanation is that you need more PE if you have, if you have less cardiolipin in order to make up for some physical properties that cardiolipin okay. confers to the membrane. I agree. But my question is, um, now, in the same system, you saw a decrease in PS, right? Is, do you think it's possible that PS decreased because there is an increased flux into PE and PS is one of the precursors? Is this a possible explanation? I think that's an absolutely wonderful explanation. It could, just, it could be all mitochondrial PE. I mean, that could really be driving it. Um, you know, that just the accelerated decarboxylation really would be a wonderful explanation. I think alternatively to that even is, is you know, disruption uh, to mitochondria could potentially prevent uh, uh, prevent uh, PS generation. So you, you, there are another number of explanations, but I think that's exactly, that's our number two hypothesis right now. So, Okay, any more questions? Yeah, thank you. That was kind of fascinating to see so many new ideas. So now, along the lines of what Mike has asked you, so a possible alternative explanation for this dramatic change in PS will be the known role of PS as a uh, phagocytic eating signal. So we know that in cells that suffer 
So they externalize PS, but also in many cases they have increased levels of PS. So now if you will be eliminating cells with overexpression of PS, you will end up with kind of less detectable PS overall in the tissue. So now you also you uh, uh, kind of uh, told us that you, you've done e exhaustive lipidomics analysis. But then you show two bars where it's just PS, PS, PS. So which of them are really disappearing? Is there any specificity in PS disappearance? Those are, yes, those are very, those are very, very, very good points. So the, I'll answer in reverse order. So I think the, uh, the, the changes are primarily in the 46 and the 45 PS, which are the primary species of PS in the heart and skeletal muscle. There's a lot of diversity between different tissues. I find it fascinating, but I have no credible way to explain it. Um, I think then, you know, the externalization thing is a fascinating point too, because of course there's neutropenia in Barr's syndrome. Uh, PS is the eat me signal for neutrophils. Lyso PS is really important for efferocytosis. I have a speech production problem sometimes. Is uh, critical for that. So you know, it could potentially be a you know, in, in Matt fantasy land, you know, that could definitely th be an explanation for some of the symptoms. And, and I think in muscle, we need to look at that, like uh, the, ex the externalization and, and the, you know, fact that turnover, basically. So, great points. Our questions, Angela. Any idea about the change in permeability in muscles? that you have shown, the, the dye entering in the, in the cell muscles? You think there is a specific site uh, of entering? I like, for example, the T-tube at the conjunction with the uh, sarcoplasmatic reticulum? That's a very interesting point. I don't know. We because, don't know. Because, you know, the, the contact points between the sarcoplasmatic reticulum and the T-tubes could be regulated by specific lipids. That's a int really interesting idea. I had not, had not occurred to me at all, but that's a great point. No, yeah, we don't know. Any other questions? In that acyl coa synthase model, or <coughs> knockout model in this mouse, you find a decrease in, in 18.2 cardiolipin, right? That's right. Is there any other changes in phospholipids? So I think this is, um, I think again, this is, there are, and this is, uh, Trisha can, Trisha's poster deals with this extensively, but I think the other thing that's really fascinating about this model for Bar syndrome is that there are no changes in MLCLs. So there's a big drop in cardiolipin, so it'll allow for testing of the, of the, of the causality of the monolysos, which is, you know, that's cool. But if so you have a lot of other lipid changes, of course, you have a lot of confounding factors. True, yeah. exactly. And there are changes in like some of the bulk, uh, pretty abundant PCs. And, but then again, we see you know, changes in a couple pretty abundant PCs as well. In Bar so it's, and I think, honestly, also, I mean, one possibility that, that Trisha brought up is that, I mean, there could be, I mean, they could be acting in, in, in series here. So there could be some, you know, they c it really could be fueling coas to phospholipids, which then are added from other phospholipids to CL or, you know, so it could, could be, acting in concerts, there could be overlap in the pathology, so. Right. Okay, so we have, um, okay, one more question. Just a nice. follow-up to that point on ACSL1 knockout, are, is the suggestion then that there is no fatty acid entry into the mitochondria in that case because you can't make the CoA, and therefore there's no oxidation going on, and therefore one would expect to see uh, lactic acidosis in these mice? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I think that, so the interesting thing about these, these, these ACLSs is that they're quite acyl chain specific. Um, so this one is really an 18-2 lover. It's a 34-fold, I think, increase, or, well, I guess it's more like 8-fold eight, eight if you do the 8-fold preference for that. So, um, but then overall, they do use a lot of glucose in, in the heart to, to just maintain sort of homeostasis. So. Um, Trisha would know the specific answer. I'm not sure about lactic acid, but I would guess that it's a po distinct possibility. I know they can get hypoglycemic in certain contexts. So, 